être un, un algébriste, mais avec une propension pour euh, euh, les, les, les applications de l'algèbre dans les théories physiques, les systèmes intégrables, euh, et qui, euh, on est fort heureux de ça, est euh, présentement euh, attaché euh, ou affilié à l'unité du CNRS qui se trouve au, au CRM. Donc, maintenant, ça s'appelle des IRL, International Research Laboratory. Et donc, il est avec nous pour une période de, prolongée de, de six mois à peu près. Euh, et euh, alors, sans, sans plus attendre, je, je lui cède la parole à nous parler, je, je le disais, d'un sujet euh, qui était très en vogue au moment où je commençais mes études de cycle supérieur, où, où les, les, les études du, des représentations de SU3 en lien avec euh, soit la physique des particules élémentaires ou encore la, la, la physique nucléaire étaient de, de, de très, très grande actualité. Et euh, nos mentors, ceux qui ont vraiment établi L'école de physique théorique euh, à Montréal, euh, Georges Patera et Pavel Vinternitz avaient énormément contribué à ce sujet-là. Trouver, c'est toujours remarquable, quand on arrive à, à reprendre, à ajouter à des sujets aussi classiques de manière moderne, et c'est de ça dont tu vas nous parler. Alors, Loïc, je t'en prie. Merci beaucoup, Luc, pour ces, ces gentils mots et uh, ça me fait très plaisir d'être ici. So, I guess I switch in to English, even if we are in Quebec. So, thanks again for the introduction, thanks for the invitation, and I uh, also would like to say thanks to the whole CRM for the, for the hospitality. It's, it's a really great pleasure to, to be here. So, today I'm going to talk about uh, centralizer algebra and some concrete application to, uh, to the missing label of, of SU3. So this is the, the outline of the, of the talk. In the first part, I will um, discuss centralizer algebra from a very general point of view, and I try to provide some, some background, some motivations. And um, okay, um, this is going to be from the point of view of, of representation theory, but I also will try to, to, to use the language of, of physics uh, somehow. And then in the second part, I will study um, explicit examples, concrete examples of, of centralizer algebra, which we call diagonal centralizers. And the, the, the main well-known example is the Raka algebra. I will say a few words about this algebra. And finally, I will uh, discuss our recent work with uh, Nicolas, Crampé, and Luc about SU3. Okay, so let's, let's start. Um, and so very slowly with a very um, easy um, beginning, something we can teach actually our, our, our students or graduates, undergraduate students maybe. So I would take a, sing a single matrix M and then already we can define a, a first uh, example of centralizer. So it's also called sometimes um, commutator algebra. So this is simply the, the set of uh, matrices which commute with M. So note that um, this is indeed an algebra, meaning that uh, we can uh, take sums of elements in here and products. This will stay inside this, this subset. So this is really um, uh, an algebra, a subalgebra of the algebra of all matrices. Okay, so what can we do with, uh, with that? Well, um, think for example, um, to a diagonal matrix M. So there are some eigenvalues. Uh, with some multiplicities. And then it's it's quite an easy exercise to check that the centralizer consists of um, all diagonal block, block diagonal matrices. And the blocks on the diagonals, the sizes of the blocks are exactly given by the multiplicities. So this is quite easy to, to check, of course, and, and rather well known. And what can we conclude? we can conclude that the centralizer knows something about the matrix M. It actually knows the, the multiplicities, the degeneracies of the, of the eigenvalues. So if you don't know M, but if you know the centralizer, you will look at it uh, under this form. You look at the sizes of the blocks and you will find the multiplicities of the eigenvalues of M. It's a very easy example, very basic example, but more or less this is almost all what is behind this story of centralizers, except that we are going to generalize a lot uh, this picture. 
So first step of generalization is to take now not a single matrix, but um, a set of matrices. So you take a set of matrices and, and then again, you can define the centralizer of this set. Natural definition, this consists of all the matrices commuting with every matrix matrices in this set. So this is the centralizer of the set S. So again, what can we what can we say about um, this uh, this algebra? Well, an interesting example is the following: say um, S is a commutative set of matrices. So all these matrices commute. This is a commutative uh, set of um, observables say so for example hermitian matrices or symmetric matrices or just diagonalizable matrices and the question is is s a complete set meaning um, is it a maximal commutative uh, subalgebra or do we need to add some other matrices to make it a complete set well again the answer is, is contained in the centralizer and so s is a complete set it's equivalent uh, for the centralizer to be a commutative algebra. So again, um, if, you, if you look at the centralizer and you, you can extract some properties of the, of the set of matrices you started with, yes, what we can say that the centralizer knows uh, actually if the set is, is complete. And moreover, but this is really obvious by definition, uh, if um, say your set, your set S is not complete, then you want to, to complete it, I guess. Then of course you will need to add uh, matrices, one or, or several matrices, commuting with your set. And where where will you find them? By definition, they will be in the centralizer of S. So the centralizer knows if the set is complete, and moreover, if it's not complete, you can use it to complete this set of observables. Good. So one more uh, rather big step for generalization, which is now like this is a serious situation. Um, we take um, we take a group G, um, any group. You can even be you can even take an algebra if you if you like, and and consider some representation of G. So, it's it really means nothing more than consider some some set of matrices, one for each element of the group G, G such that the multiplication of G is is um, preserved by, by by this map. So, so you have a set of matrices, rho of G indexed by the element of the group. And can we define the centralizer? I hope that now it's, it's obvious definition. We, we have a set of matrices, so we can define the centralizer of this set. All matrices commuting with rho of G for any G. Okay, so this is a definition. This is the last definition of centralizer, uh, one of the most general. And, and again, it, it contains a lot of information. So. First of all, I have to quote at least once this, this result, very well known, which is called the Schur Lemma. And you, you see, it's exactly an example of what I'm talking about. It's, it gives, um, it relates some information on the representation to the centralizer. So the statement is like this. The representation row is irreducible. It's equivalent for the centralizer to be uh, to consist of the set of, of the multiples of the identity matrix. Actually, note that um, these matrices Identity, multiple of identity matrix, uh, they always commute with, with everything. So in a sense, Schur Lemma says that uh, the representation row is irreducible if and only if the centralizer is as small as possible. Good, and um, what happens if the representation is not irreducible? So in general, a representation will not be irreducible, of course, uh, but you can write it as a direct sum of irreducible representations. So here V1, V2, Vk are different, different irreducible representations of G, but they may appear with some multiplicities. So to be, to be clear, uh, M1 is, is a positive integer, say one, it can, can be one, of course, but it could be also two, three or more. And this notation means that we have V1 plus V1 plus V1 several times. Okay, so if we have such a representation, um, what can we say about the centralizer? Well, the, there is a first thing we can say, which is direct corollary of, of, of uh, Schur's lemma, actually. And it's the following. The multiplicities are all equal to one. It, it's a very important uh, particular situation because we have no multiplicity. 
we say that it's uh, multiplicity free. So all multiplicities are one. It's equivalent for, uh, to the following statement. The centralizer is commutative. So I hope that you see the, the, the parallel with my first example. Um, maybe I can go back to this. You see, if you had only one matrix, you have this uh, centralizer, the block diagonal matrices. And what, ha what happens if the multiplicities are all one, then the blocks are trivial, they are of size one. This consists of all diagonal matrices, and of course, it's a commutative algebra. And it, be, it, it starts to, <laughs> it is starting to become non-commutative as soon as one of the multiplicity becomes greater than one. So this is the, um, this statement is a generalization to any representation of any group G actually of this example. We can say that the centralizer knows um, when a representation is irreducible, and even better, it actually knows when the representation can be decomposed into a direct sum with no multiplicity. And in fact, we have even more, and this is the last, last uh, most general statement we can make. If the multiplicities are not one, are arbitrary positive integers, then the, the algebraic structure of the centralizer is as follows. It is simply, yes, yeah, simply the direct sum of matrix algebras and the sizes of the, the matrix, uh, the matrices are again the multiplicities. So again, this, the parallel with, with my first example with only one matrix should be obvious. These are the, 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 the blocks on the diagonal of size, the multiplicities. So at the end of this uh, short introduction, the centralizer knows all about the multiplicities of, of, of the representation row. And that's uh, why they are so useful in representation theory. Let me go a little bit further in, in, into these uh, questions. So again, start with a representation, write it as a direct sum of irreducible, uh, possibly with multiplicities. Now focus in one on, on, on one of these subspaces. So again, this is V1 plus V1 several times. You can write it as a tensor product. You can write it as V1 tensor product with M1. And this M space is a bit artificial at this point. It's some sort of um, auxiliary space which records the multiplicity M1. So the, di the dimension of this big M1 is uh, the integer uh, M1. Let's look at this picture from uh, two different points of view. First point of view, let's look at it from the point of view of G, the, the one we started with. So G is actually um, acting only on, the, the, on its representation, V1 and V2. And so the spaces, the multiplicity spaces are quite um, transparent for G. They are, they are not relevant. They, G is acting trivially on this space. So from the point of view of G, this is, this is a complicated way to say that V1 appears with some multiplicity. But of course, there is a second point of view, kind of um, dual point of view, which is to look at this representation from the point of view, from the other side, from the point of view of the centralizer itself. So from the point of view of the centralizer, well, it's completely symmetric. Centralizer is only this is sure lemma. Centralizer is only permuting the different copies of, uh, of, of a single representation. So it's only acting on the multiplicity space. And um, it, it's not acting on V1, for example, here. Meaning that uh, the, the relevant spaces for the centralizer are these multiplicity spaces. And this, the representations of G becomes the um, auxiliary spaces recording the multiplicities from the point of view of the centralizer. So this is best expressed by these two formulas, where you see the, role, the roles of Vs and Ms are um, exchanged. And this is, a, this is a slogan that I like to, to remember. Um, multiplicities for G are the dimensions for the centralizers. And of course, this is a, a duality. This is a, there is a vice versa. The, the, if you if you if you become interested only in the centralizer, why not? Then the multiplicities for the centralizer uh, will be the dimensions for the representations of G. So um, 
this is very general, but let me try to, 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 to say it at this point. We, we can discuss the problem of labeling vectors already uh, here. So the problem is the following. We have a vector space, which is written this way. Why not? And we want to, um, to label vectors in, in, in the quantum mechanics uh, way. So we want to find operators, uh, commuting family of, of operators, and then their eigenvalues will, will uh, index our, our vectors. And um, of course, so we, we, we started with our group G. So we think that we may take um, some operators from G which commute and, and try to label the vectors uh, thanks to, to them. And there is a problem. It's, it's, it, will be, it will be impossible as soon as some multiplicity is greater than one. Why? Well, I hope I, I made it clear already. G only sees uh, the irreducible representation, V1 and V2. But if V1 appears, say, twice, then operators from G, almost by definition, cannot make any difference between the two copies of V1, meaning that you can take any operator you want from G, it, won't, it will not see the difference between the first copy of V1 and the second copy of V1, meaning that it will be impossible to um, uniquely or unambiguously uh, label uh, your vectors using only operators from G. Okay. So what's what's the what's the solution? It's, it should be obvious. Uh, we need uh, we need to distinguish vectors inside these auxiliary spaces, these multiplicity spaces. From G, it's impossible. But uh, there is an algebra which is of operators which is uh, telling how to do it. It's the centralizer because the centralizer is exactly acting on these spaces. So we need to find operators acting on, say, M1, and they come from the, from the centralizer. So now the centralizer will be able, almost by definition, to distinguish between different copies of the same representation of G. And so if you start with a um, maximal commutative um, algebra of operators from G, it's not enough. You must complete it. And you may, you, you may want you, you need to complete it using operators coming from the centralizer. So this will be the main um, ingredient in, in, in the second part of the, of the talk. OK, so conclusion, whenever you have a missing label problem in a representation of a group G, for example, then you will be able to find a solution if you know the centralizer. Well, of course, the difficult part is to actually understand this centralizer and to find explicit uh, operators um, resolving the, the, the ambiguity. And this is what we will do um, in the second part of the talk. So I guess this is the most general uh, I will be. Uh, let's mention the, the, the most famous example, the Schurweil duality. So um, this traces back to the early, early work in representation theory by Schur in the beginning of the 20th century. It has been greatly um, popularized, I should say, and also general, generalized by Hermann Weil, and also um, applied to, to, to concrete problems in, in physics, for example. So what's the situation? So the group G is, is um, SUN, and the representation we take is just a vector representation. So these are matrices of si size n, and I, I I, I, we act on vectors of size n also. We are going to make tensor product. And so let me skip this, this part because it's not so important for what follows. So we make tensor product of V and, and we can decompose into irreducible representation. And there are some multiplicities appearing. And the story of the centralizer is that these multiplicities should be explained thanks to the centralizer. So let's, let me state the, the, the main theorem. It turns out that the centralizer of SUN acting on a tensor product like that is isomorphic. It's, it's, I mean, it's given by the symmetric group SN. And so at the end, this complicated representation decomposes as follows, where the, the V lambdas are the reducible representation of SUN. 
And the multiplicity spaces are actually irreducible representation of the symmetry group Sn. So these numbers here, two, three, two, three, they are actually dimensions of representation of the symmetry group. And we, we of course, we understand very, very well this representation theory. So this has been extremely useful um, in many, for many different uh, aspects. And also let me say that this is probably one of the most um, beautiful statements in representation theory for the simple following reason. Uh, in, in when you when you in, you're inter interested in groups, then probably uh, the symmetric group is the most fundamental group when you look at finite group. When you, when you look at matrix group or Lie groups, compact Lie groups, then the most fundamental group is probably SUN. And this statement actually relates very closely this, the representation theory of these two groups. And in a sense, they are almost uh, equivalent. You can deduce the whole representation theory of SUN from the knowledge of SN and vice versa. So very nice and very useful. So there has been, of course, many generalizations and I'm just making a list here. Um, let me go over this quickly to, to save time. Um, so you, you can consider different groups, different representations. And my, my point here is that when you look at centralizers, you will find very interesting and very well-known algebras. So you see temporary algebra, symmetric group, the Brouwer algebra, the Heckler algebra, the BMW algebra, all these algebras have been very interesting, very useful in, in various fields of various areas of mathematics and also um, in physics. And the, okay, the general uh, statement is that, you know, that you see the quantum groups appearing here. Um, and okay, since we are here, I can mention it. Quantum groups are, are very interesting objects they are quite complicated, but one way to understand why they are so interesting is actually through their centralizers, because uh, the way they are constructed um, is such that uh, there is this property, the centralizer uh, can, can provide topolog topological invariants for knots and links, and they can also provide solutions of the young baxter equation, so they, they are useful in, in integrable systems for, for spin chains model. So you see in my example, temporary lib, Hecker, and BMW algebra, they appear as centralizer of some quantum groups representations. But if you are not a theorist, you will know them because they produce the most famous invariants, polynomial invariants, which are respectively the Jones polynomial, Humphrey polynomial, and Kaufman polynomial. So again, the, the message here is, is I, don't want, I don't want to go into details, but the message is the following. If you look at the cent at centralizers of some representations, you will find very interesting algebras. That's the conclusion here. And since, since we're here, I make little adv advertisement for, for my own work. So we have been very proud with uh, Nicolas Crampé to, to be able to add a, a line in this table. So we considered more general representations and we we define, we, we, or we discovered, if you want, um, some new algebras, very interesting, which we called uh, fused permutations or fused Heckler algebra. But this is really the, the topic of, uh, of a different talk. So let me um, stop here with this uh, first part and pass to and, and go on with the second part of the talk. You see, the general idea was um, we, we produce interesting algebras when we look at centralizers. So can we produce other interesting algebras? And I will change a little bit the, the, the picture uh, like this. Instead of, um, so we have been looking so far to, to partic particular representation of very often tensor product representation of some group or Lie algebra. Now we will do something a bit different. We will go universal, meaning that we will um, try to study the centralizer of any possible representation in one shot. One way to do this is to um, consider the so-called diagonal centralizer, which I'm going to define in, in a moment. And this is going to be very interesting, we hope, and actually we, we have a good uh, motivation for that, which is the Raka algebra. You see the story of the Raka algebra for, I mean, for me and for Nicola is, is the following. We, 
we have been um, enjoying the hospitality of the CRM uh, on, on a regular basis now since three, four years, especially Nicola, I guess. And then, then we, we, we met Luke, of course, and we had many discussions and we, we, we learned about the Raqqa algebra a lot. And we got to understand at some point that the Raqqa algebra was an example of these diagonal centralizers. And it's very interesting algebra. So of course we got quite interested and we, we tried to, um, to generalize it to other situations. And after SU2, of course, you will think of SU3. And this is what we have done with Nicola and Luke. And we have defined, I mean, I'm going to, to describe the, the algebra that we find uh, in this uh, context. So this is the plan for the, the rest of the talk. Okay, so a slide of generality, generality is a little, a little bit. So in general, G is going to be SU, SU2 and SU3 in a moment. But uh, in general, if you have a Lie group, of course, it's, it's very convenient to replace it by its, by its Lie algebra. And when you have the Lie algebra, you may want to consider the universal enveloping algebra because this is a good and honest uh, associative algebra. And representation of G is equivalent, are equivalent to representations of the enveloping algebra. So we are going to work with this object here. So I'm going to define a centralizer in a moment. So centralizer is going to be a set of elements commuting with something. And so let me define the something first. Uh, we can embed the Lie algebra G into the tensor product of say, for example, two copies of U of G. And this is a very natural embedding. You take an element of G, you make it act on the first copy, you make it act on the second copy, and you take the sum. Of course, you can do it for more than two copies, and this is going to be the same thing, the sum of, of G acting on, on, on each copy. Good, so this is the diagonal embedding. This is how we actually uh, produce, um, how we actually uh, take tensor product of representation for a Lie algebra. So the centralizer, the diagonal centralizer is going to be the set of elements commuting with the diagonal embedding. You see, this is a bit more abstract from, for now, but I hope it's okay. Uh, now I'm working inside this big, big algebra, the, uni the tensor product of the universal enveloping algebra. And I'm looking at elements X, which commute with all possible uh, images of G through the diagonal embedding, which commute with the diagonal embedding of G. So formally, this is express, expressed by this uh, definition. Another way of saying it, mathematically equivalent, is to say that the diagonal centralizer consists of invariants inside the tensor product for the diagonal adjoint action of the group G. So it's, it's a very fundamental uh, algebra for, for sure. Uh, for example, but it's not very interesting, but it's and if you take n is one, then you are defining the center of the universal enveloping algebra. Of course, very uh, well known and very interesting. So for n bigger than one, this is a generalization of the center and we call it the diagonal centralizer. Okay, if you're, if you're worrying about representations, then let me tell you that um, if you take now any representations of your group G, then this diagonal centralizer will act on this and will produce for you the usual centralizer, the centralizer of the representation. So you see, this is, uh, we see it as, um, as a way. So this is, in some sense, this is the universal centralizer. Uh, it, it, um, if you understand this algebra, it will help you to understand the centralizer of any tensor product of representation. That's why it's so uh, interesting. It is also why I guess it's, it's quite difficult because it contains information of, uh, about all the centralizers of all representations. So it's, it's, it might be a bit difficult to understand this algebra. So let's hope we will be able to do it. Okay, so the famous example of the Raqqa algebra. So you see it, it has been um, discovered say uh, some time ago, kind of key and I'll say is it enough um, with, with problem really related to physics. So what is it? it? It's going to be the diagonal centralizer for SU2. So simplest, um, the simplest simple Lie algebra and uh, three copies. So we take tensor product of three representations of SU2. 
Oh, and also let me tell you right now, before I forget that I will be lying to you a little bit. Uh, I'm, I will never describe this algebraic object completely. I will always describe it in, uh, I will always describe its image in representation somehow. So don't worry about it. It means that, for example, in, in, in this case, in SU2, I will have parameters instead of central elements. So it's, it's a bit of, it's quite equivalent. So don't worry about that. It's just to simplify the, the presentation. So SU2, three representations. So as you know, probably um, irreducible representation of SU2, they are indexed by a half integer spin. So let me take three of them, G1, J1, J2, J3. And of course, uh, it's going to, to write as a direct sum of, of representation. So let me take a fourth one and it will appear with some multiplicity. So the parameters of the algebra, there are four, uh, the four spins that you have selected here. And then uh, it turns out that um, there, there, is, there are two generators. So uh, there are some, some natural explanations. So A is, is acting on the, uh, the, it is the coupling of the two first uh, representation and B, the coupling of the two second representations. But from, from my point of view, uh, in this talk, I, I'm going to describe an algebra. So I really need to, to tell you what are the generators of the algebra. So here are the parameters, that's fine. And here are the generators. And this, um, and so actually this is the simplest possibility because there is there are only two generators. So now as I'm saying it, I, I can imagine you behind the screen complaining like, no, this is not the simplest possibility. Simplest possibility will be to have only one generator. Well, but remember, um, when there are some multiplicities, and, and there are here, the centralizer is not commutative. But if there were only one generator, this will produce a commutative algebra. So we know from the beginning that at least two generators are needed. And for the Raka algebra, this is what happens, only two. So the simplest situation uh, possible. Okay, so what is the, this algebra? As I just told you, A and B, they cannot commute, they do not commute. So we will calculate their commutator. And this is a new element, C. And so then we calculate the commutator of A and B with C. And it turns out that we find this formula. So I don't want, I mean, it's not really, a, the precise form of the formula is not so important here. Uh, we can see that it um, it looks like a Lie algebra a little bit because we have commutators, but it's it's quite different. We have quadratic terms here. This is the anti-commutator, a b plus b a. So we have a square b square a b plus b a. This is not a Lie algebra. This is actually a quadratic algebra. Okay, and the parameters here, I don't want to to give the formula. They are not important. They just are expressed in terms of the parameters uh, j. Okay, so that's. That's the Raka algebra. That's the, Raka, the, the algebra that is so uh, interesting. And um, let me mention this, this little miracle here appearing here. Actually, this algebra, so we have been calculating, the way I present it is the algebra coming from the diagonal centralizer of SU2. Actually, it has appeared in also in a, it appears also in a completely different context. It appears in the context of orthogonal polynomials. It is, in fact, the algebra satisfied by the difference operator and the recurrence operator completely characterizing the so-called Raka or Raka-Wilson polynomials. So this is a very good sign. This is extremely important. In fact, uh, this, that this algebra must be interesting because it appears already in two different areas. So let me... <laughs> conclude with this picture, we have a very inter interesting algebra. It's called the Raka algebra, and it appears in this, at least in these three different topics, orthogonal polynomials, the SU2 recoupling theory, actually the problem of, of Raka coefficients. And this is more or less the story that I'm telling right now. And it also appears in the, the theory of in some uh, super integrable systems. So the way I see it is this very nice, beautiful example of um, interactions between these three uh, topics 
representation theory, special functions, and mathematical physics. So beautiful algebra, and we again we we found it. I mean, one can find it by looking at the diagonal centralizer of SU two. And this small, uh, I mean, this quick uh, introduction to the Raka algebra should uh, explain that the the Raka coefficient, the recoupling coefficient of SU two, are actually given in terms of Raka uh, Raka Wilson polynomials. It is because the Raka algebra appears, the same algebra, Raka algebra, appears in these two different uh, contexts. OK, so I hope it was not too fast. Uh, just want to maybe remember that um, we found we, we, we do find an interesting algebra by looking at the diagonal centralizer. So now we want to, we want to find others. We want more. So let me mention that we we have been able to describe the um, SU2 situation with any n, so any uh, number of copies. This is so-called higher rank hacker algebra. And so we, we, we recently obtained a complete description of this algebra with uh, Nicolas and Luc again, and also Julien Agaborio. And um, also I had to mention that if we consider quantum group now, um, this is also well known uh, by Elsa Zedanov that we will find a very interesting algebra, uh, which is called Askew Wilson algebra. So, this is a Q deformation of the Raka algebra. It's probably um, as, at least as interesting as the Raka algebra itself. It appears in many, dif many different contexts. And so, looking at quantum groups seems also very promising. But I won't do that in this talk. So, yeah, as you can see, uh, this is all about SU2. So what about other uh, groups than SU2? Well, we will, we will not be very ambitious. We will just discuss uh, SU3 now. And so this is already quite uh, difficult. So for SU3, the first uh, thing I have to say is that multiplicities arise already when we take a tensor product of two representations. You see, for SU2, multiplicities arise um, when we take three-fold tensor products. For SU3, already two-fold tensor products is going to be non-trivial. And let me recall you maybe that, that um, reducible of SU3, you need to specify two positive integers. Okay, so for, S, for SU2, it was only one. For SU3, you need two, M1 and M2. So I'm going to take right now and to the end of the talk, three different irreducible representation of SU3. So it means that I chose six uh, positive integers once and for all, OK? OK, so I take two irreducible representation. I made a tensor product. This is, this is our representation of SU3 now. And uh, okay, making tensor product of SU3 representation is extremely important in, in many different contexts, um, for example, in particle physics with the quark model and so on. So this is not crazy things to consider that have been studied a lot. And we know, for example, that uh, they will decompose, uh, of course, as, as they had some of irreducible, but multiplicities may appear already. So uh, the, the third representation that I chose appears here, and it possibly with multiplicity greater than one. So again, from the point of view of labeling vectors, we have a missing label problem. As I, I hope I explained it well uh, in the first part, multiplicities mean that we cannot specify a vector here using only SU3, because SU3 will not see the difference between the two, um, the several, um, uh, several different copies of the same representation. OK, so let me use the same trick as before. I write, I write this uh, direct sum of um, several times the same representation as a tensor product. SU3 is acting here, and we need operators acting on the multiplicity space, and this is going to be uh, given by the centralizer. OK, so as before. So the answer is the centralizer, Z2 of SU3. So of course, the question now are, um, can we describe this guy? Can we describe this centralizer question? It turns out that we, we, we were able to do it. But uh, then can we calculate explicitly the operators acting on the resolving the multiplicity, giving the missing label? Meaning, can we describe the operators acting on the multiplicity space? Well, we, we, we could do it also. 
And uh, the third question is, uh, now that we have done that, <laughs> did we learn something on the missing label problem? And this I will try to um, answer this question in the remaining, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes or so of the, of the talk. So let's start with the, the algebraic description of the two SU3. So remember, uh, there will be some parameters. The parameters, we already chose them, six parameters giving the three irreducible representations of SU3. Okay, so what about the generators? Well, it turns out, this is quite, um, this, is, this, this was the first surprise, I guess, in, in this work, that we only need also two generators. So remember, this is a minimal amount of, of generators, and this, this happens also for Z2 SU3. It seems that it will always be the case. I, I can assure you that it's not. It's, it, it really means that we have some sort of special situation. So Z3 of SU2 and Z2 of SU3 are simple enough so that we can generate the centralizer by only two elements. So this X and Y, they, they do act on this multiplicity space. So let me summarize the first, um, first pack of results we got. Uh, first of all, this X, and this y, they both can distinguish the vectors in the multiplicity space. So either one of them is a solution of the missing label problem. So um, this it means really concretely that uh, using um, SU3 operators, you can really specify a unique vector in this space, but then you need additional label to deal with the multiplicity and x or y can provide uh, to use this, uh, this missing label. So these are really the operators we are interested. OK, second statement is that any other missing label operator that you could think of is going to be actually generated by X and Y. So X and Y are enough to produce all the possibilities. And I'm really saying again here that X and Y are generating the diagonal centralizer. This is another way of, of saying it more fancy way, maybe. And OK, let me mention that we, we, we have calculated explicitly. So this is, this is what I want to say. This is really explicit. We have calculated the matrices for X and Y on this, on this um, space. So now say that you some uh, that is say that you are studying the tensor product of SU3 representation and you want to, to label your vectors here and uh, then you can ask us for the, the matrix for X, for example, we can give it to you and then you can calculate the eigenvalues and they are all different so they can they, they can serve as as a missing label. And I have to mention that of course this was this is an old problem. So the matrix for X was actually calculated a long time ago in a slightly different form, which is a bit less nice for the, for the remaining statements that I will make. And it seems that the full centralizer, so X and Y, uh, was never considered before. And the matrices we found, they are quite nice, actually. They are both three diagonal matrices, so not completely crazy uh, matrices. So what about the algebraic description of the centralizer? So again, this works exactly like for the Raka algebra. So let me go over this a bit quickly. Uh, so I take X and Y, they do not commute as before, so they produce a new element Z. And then I take Z and I make the commutator with X and Y. So of course, what, what, what you should expect now, uh, what we were expecting actually, is that these commutators will produce again other elements and it's going to be very complicated maybe. But also maybe you think like, okay, I, I can see the letters, it's X, Y, Z, probably there is <laughs> nothing more because there is no more letters after, after Z. So if you think this, you're, you're, you're actually right. Uh, the result, non-surprising result, is that as for the Raka algebra, the algebra closes at this point. So we can, we can write these commutators as uh, in terms of X and Y. And it, so it looks quite similar. Let me just point out to you that it's similar, except that we, we have some cubic term here. So it's actually completely different realm of, of algebras. We, we are leaving the world of quadratic algebra and then we, we enter the world of cubic algebra. It looks like a um, small difference, but it's actually, it's, it's not. 
Okay, and, and, and to be completely um, complete, I have to mention that there is another relation that we should uh, put here. So it's not so important, but um, I, I still have to mention it. Actually, it was already there for in the in the, the case of the Raqqa algebra, but I, I mean, I skipped it because I want to save time. But so it's important for the, the next statement, namely that we have a complete algebraic description of the centralizer. So we need this additional relation. Don't worry about omega. It's a certain central element. And this relation say that uh, we have to fix the value of the central element omega um, in a certain way. OK, all these parameters appearing in the algebra, they, they depend on, on m. They depend explicitly on, on m. So we have six of them, um, which are polynomials in, in, in m. So as I said, this is a cubic generalization of the Raqqa algebra. We, we think that this may be a very interesting algebra. Um, the first algebraic properties is that it, it's an example of a Calabio algebra. It also seems to be related to a symplectic reflection algebra. So very quickly, we, we, we found that this algebra must be interesting. OK, so where are we? Uh, almost at the end. So the, the first question of the description of the centralizer. OK, it's done. Operators on the, the missing label operators, we have calculated them. Good. So now uh, I have to, I would like to answer the question, do we learn something on the missing label? OK, so at this point, we, we do, we, we have learned something about the missing label, right? We have learned that uh, the missing label can be given by X or by Y and that this is the algebra satisfied by x and y. So this is already a piece of information, but we want, we want more. We want more exciting information. So to do this, we have to look at the, the, these coefficients. So I won't give you, uh, don't worry, I won't give you the explicit formula. They are not so nice. But I'm going to tell you something incredible about these coefficients. We were extremely uh, surprised by this result. Um, so what are they? Remember, there are polynomials in, in these variables m. And this funny uh, indexing that I used, 2, 5, 6, is just giving you the, the degrees. So there are polynomials, and a2 is a polynomial of degree 2 in six variables. a5 is a polynomial in degree 5, and so on. OK, so we have this um, sequence of uh, integers. And as soon as we have a sequence of integers, we, we all always want to understand what, what it is. Do, can we recognize something? It's, it's, the answer is, is not easy, it's not obvious at all, but we found it somewhere. So this is a sort of a screenshot, I guess, of a, of a book about reflection groups and cluster groups. And you see here, what you see here is, so it's not really important, right? But what you see here is, um, um, root systems, different uh, root systems or, or, or um, different simple Lie algebra, if you want. Uh, SU, uh, SU3 is here, it's of, of type A. But the, the line we have to look at is the line indexed by E6, because you see, we found exactly uh, our, our degrees. So what is this table? It's a bit complicated, so I won't enter into details, but it gives you the degrees of invariant polynomials or let me say that invariant polynomials is like generalizing the symmetric polynomials for, for other root systems. So uh, these ones are the invariant polynomials for a certain group, which is the Weyl group of type E6. So some sort of reflection group associated to the root system of type E6. Why E6 should be appearing here, it's a complete mystery for, for me. But OK, uh, we have this numerical coincidence. For now, it's a bit stupid. I'm just telling you that we have six polynomials of certain degrees and, and that somewhere else, there are six other polynomials which have the same degrees. So it's, it's not really um, important, but it turns out that it's, it's not a numerical coincidence. Uh, our, our main uh, result, one of our main results, the one I like the most actually, <laughs> is the following. Um, there is a certain action of this vile group of E6 on our parameter set. This is very well hidden. I mean, we really had to look for it to find it. It's not obvious at all that this, I mean, there is no clear explanation why this vile group should act on this parameter set, but it does. And it does, and then the polynomials we have, the, the parameters here, 
are exactly, uh, to our surprise, invariant polynomials under this action of the, of the vial group of E6. And so it turns out, this is, this is a very large group actually, yeah? it's several, uh, I mean, 50,000, something like that. Uh, so we turn out that it turns out that we have a huge group of symmetry of this diagonal centralizer and the group that we were not expecting at all. So last slide, I will tell you that how we extract from this large symmetry group the actual physical symmetry, the symmetry of the missing label. What do, uh, what do I mean by that? Okay, so remember again this situation, tensor product of two representation, we choose uh, an irreducible component, it appears with some multiplicities and we have calculated some explicit matrices acting on this multiplicity space, which are given the missing label. I mean, the eigenvalues are serving as uh, distinguishing the, the vectors here. So we can ask the following question. Can I find uh, two different set of parameters, M and M tilde, such that the matrices are going to be not the same, but conjugated. Conjugated, I mean, by a change of basis or conjugated by, by an invertible matrices, by matrix. So why is it relevant? It's relevant because the missing label are the eigenvalues, remember, of X or of Y. So if they are conjugated, of course, they have the same eigenvalues. It means that the missing label will be the same for parameters M or parameters M tilde. So if we have such a transformation, M goes to M tilde such that the two, the two pairs of matrices are conjugated, we can call them, we can call this transformation a symmetry of the missing label because the missing label will be preserved, will be the same. Okay, so long story short, we, uh, we take our huge uh, vial group of E6 and we try to extract such transformations and we were able to do it and this is the final result. It's a bit complicated, sorry, but you don't, you don't have to look at the details. So this is, um, um, this is a table of numbers, three by three and another three by three square. In it, enters all, enter all the parameters of the representation. Of course, there is a notation for L and N that you can safely ignore. So I make, we make a, a table of three by six integers, which is a weird, a fancy way to organize all our uh, parameters, M1, M prime one, and so on. If you, if you are into such uh, things, uh, you can notice that uh, these are actually ma magic squares. I mean, the sum of the line, the colon and diagonal, they are all giving the same numbers, but okay, why not? And the statement is as follows. You can perform some very easy transformations on this square, on this uh, arrays of integers, and this will give you symmetry of the missing label. So what are the transformations? Well, as you can read here, you can permute two colons of, of, um, of these matrices, of this square, but you have to do it simultaneously on the two, on the left side and on the right side. Okay. You can also permute some lines. This is also allowed. You can transpose this three by three matrix, and you have to do it simultaneously on the, on the right hand side. And finally, uh, you can also exchange these two, uh, two squares. So the statement is that all these transformations, they are symmetry of the missing label. And to con I mean, I have to conclude somehow, um, and I have to tell you that there are obvious symmetries of the problem of the missing label. And there are some obvious symmetries. For example, you can exchange, exchange these two representations. This will be a symmetry, obvious symmetry. So the obvious symmetries are, are the their numbers are uh, is twelve. Okay, and so how many do we have? We have much more actually. We have one hundred and forty-four. So the full symmetry of the missing label is, is bigger than that, and uh, we can conclude that we have found new as far as we know, new symmetry of the missing label for SU3. Okay, so I guess that's the way uh, I can conclude now. Um, I can tell you that it has been uh, very, uh, very fun to, to work on this project with, with Nicolas and Luc. It was, has been a very great pleasure. And I think it's a, it's a nice example to, of, of a story which goes like that. We, start, we started with some sort of 
I mean, question inspired, inspired from, from physics, labeling vectors. Then we went into more abstract mathematics, you know, root systems and reflection groups. This is actually a picture of, of the root system of type E6, you see, beautiful uh, picture. And then at the end, we, we were able to go back to some more physical questions about symmetries of the missing label. So I really, um, I really enjoyed uh, working on this and I guess that's uh, the most important conclusion that I, I can make. Thank you for your attention. Uh, there are some questions. Thank you very much, uh, the light. Gilles. Uh, hi, so thanks Loic for the talk. Uh, I have two very, very maybe naive questions. The first one, so on your last slide, uh, you have 12 obvious symmetries, mm -hmm. 100 and never mind. So my this, is, this, is, this is 12 square, right? But I, I don't know, I don't know why, but this is 12 times 12. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my question, but I guess it's a bit too. Uh, but for, um, so my question is, you mentioned the connection between uh, the centralizer for the quantum groups and the solution of the young baxter equation. Yes. So uh, I was wondering if uh, explain a bit more about that, like what exactly does this centralizer give you? Like, does it give you the R matrix which satisfies the young baxter or what? Okay, that's okay. That's a good question for sure. And uh, the answer will not be so easy, but I do my best. Um, so the quantum groups are, are designed such that um, in their centralizer, you will have the R matrices actually. They are matrices, they are, they, they, or maybe I put it this way. They, they are matrices of quantum groups. They naturally live in the centralizer. So if you study the centralizers, then you will have at hand this R matrices. And that site that satisfies the, the, the braid relation. So it's not the Unbachelor equation for now. But um, we know, and this is, I have to insist, this is like the abstract result. We know for more general consideration quite complicated consideration actually about affine quantum groups and so on, that um, in this centralizer will also leave some solution of the young baxter equation. We know that they will be here. And then it's, it's very interesting because once we have the algebra at hand, we know that this algebra somehow contains a solution of the young baxter equation. But it remains, I mean, we have to find it. And that's, that's very interesting. Uh, problem. And for example, uh, I can take the example of the temporal lib algebra, and we, we know exactly what is the solution of the Baxter equation inside the temporal lib algebra. It's a simple formula. In the Hecker algebra, it's also a very simple formula. In the BMW algebra, it's also known. It's less simple. It's due to Jones, actually. And uh, then so if you have more complicated centralizers, we will we know that we will have a solution in the Baxter equation, but we have to find it. And so, for example, with Nicola, we were able to to find the solution corresponding to the fused Hecker algebra. And it's a, it's a beautiful. I mean, OK, of course, it's beautiful because I, 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 I find it beautiful, right. of course. But so it's a, it's a non-trivial formula. That's what I want to say. It's, it, it's really a complicated formula involving Q numbers all, all, over, all over the place. And that's yeah, very nice. So to answer your question, yeah, this is abstract uh, statement. It's like the, the very first motivation for quantum groups. And uh, we have to remember that uh, this solution of the Baxter equations they actually live in the centralizers. So maybe a good way to study them is to first understand the centralizer. Okay. Eva? Um, two questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, almost the last slide, the one before the last one, you are counting your uh, generators or your symmetry. So no, the one, the, the next, after, 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 the 12 of the yeah, 12 yeah. Before, before, yeah. Okay. So um, that's probably the uh, permutation of lines and columns that you're counting, right? Yes. Because uh, actually, the, if I understand correctly, the symmetry group is isomorphic to uh, the Weyl group of E6. No, 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 correct? no, no, that's not correct. Um, the Weyl group of E6 has order like uh, 50 yeah. thousands of something like that. But um, if you take uh, any transformation from the Weyl group, it will take a parameters M and send it to another one. And this will be like negative integers. I and mean, this won't be, uh. this won't preserve the physical constraints if you want. So if you reduce, uh, so if you take inside the Weyl group, the transformation which actually preserve 
say the size of the matrices, then you, you have 144. And so you might be disappointed because you started for, with 50,000 and we, we end up with 144, but that's already a non-trivial uh, number of symmetries. Do you know the structure of the, this? It's a finite group. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, we know the structure very well. I, I, yeah. I have to apologize. I mean, if Nicola were here, I would have to apologize to him because he has a very nice picture describing this structure. And I, okay, I don't show it, but yeah, it's basically um, permutations of lines, it's six elements, permutations of colon, it's six elements, transposing it's one more element and it's, it's, it's really related. So you have something of order 36 times two, 72, and then exchanging the two squares, it's no. times two and you you find this and so it's some sort of direct semi-direct product but this action is on the label n so it kinds of relate um various uh centralizer algebra those yes. attached to different labels exactly but there's no action on the generator x and y by themselves they really act on the parameter yeah exactly so if you want i mean this um okay i, I can formulate it this way uh, these symmetries, they are automorphism of the centralizers of a very special kind because they send X to X <laughs> and Y to Y. That's they are, they are, they are the way they are acting. So the other way of saying it is that the, the parameters are invariant. All your parameters of the algebra, they are actually invariant under a very large group, which is this phi group. It doesn't tell us if there's a automorphism mixing the X and the Y or some function of polynomials of these generators exactly you, you you're completely right uh this will be this, this is open question this will be unnatural from the point of view of the centralizer because um x and y they are like canonical generators so it will be f for degree degree consideration for example it will be not natural to exchange x and y they don't have the same degrees as element of the of the of the Lie algebra but you're right, mathematically, maybe there are other automorphisms doing some crazy things on X and Y. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Simeon. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, Do I understand correctly that that's the uh, simplest example where this uh, automorphism group is non-trivial, the, the Z2 of SU3? In other words, are there any uh, any other example where it's computed and you can, you know, uh, do do the... I mean, start study the relations and and see the, the yeah, look yeah, at yeah. the degrees. Uh, I, I I like I like your question. Of course, uh, it's a very good question. So the answer depends on the following thing: Do you consider Z two of S U three being simpler than Z three of S U two or not? Oh, <laughs> oh, so <laughs> but uh, is it is it is it uh, what? Uh, yeah, uh, probably told this. Well, what what's the answer for Z, Z3 of SU2? I haven't told, I haven't said it, but I will now. So to answer your question, there is you 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 must remember first the simplest situation is for n is one, mm -hmm. where it's not a diagonal centralizer, but it's the um, the center of the algebra. And now for the center of the algebra, there is a nice theorem which is called Arish Chandra Chevalier theorem, oh, okay. which tells you that the center actually consists or is isomorphic to the invariant polynomials under the vile group, but the, the real vile group of the uh -huh, algebra uh -huh, you started uh -huh. with. So yes, the answer is uh, for the center, there is such a description. Now for the Raka algebra, there is actually one, and I like to question your question because in, just in case I, 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 I put it here. <laughs> so for the Raka algebra, oh. the, the answer is simpler and the vile group which is appearing is actually D4. And it was more or less already understood by LCZ and off, I guess. Uh, we, we understood it a, a posteriori, actually. It was like, okay, what about the Raka algebra? So it's simpler. It's a value group of type D4. It, it's already surprising, I guess. Yeah. And outside of these cases, problem is that we don't know the centralizer. But I, I mean, if, I, if I have to express my, my personal opinion, I think these are special, special cases where there are more symmetries because, you know, small SU, SUN and small number of representations. I would guess that this will not happen for other uh, centralizers, but question is completely open. Also, also D4 and E6 are very special kind of root systems, right? So, because exactly. they have this non-trivial non -trivial symmetry. So. <laughs> exactly. And then actually they, are, they have in common the fact that they are, they are simply laced 
and uh, uh, there is some sort of tree shape. I mean, like there is a trivalent vertex. No, but this tri trivalent, vert tri trivalent vertex in E6, uh, you have a symmetry with respect to the flipping, which won't be in E7, E8. And in D4, like in, in D4, there will be more symmetry than in D5 and higher because of, you can- Yeah, you're right. Otherwise it's, so you're that's... completely right. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's... Okay, well, we, we will conclude, uh, Loic. Uh... Thank you. I invite everybody to thank you again. You you really uh, made us share in the fun of the problem. Thank you for <laughs> a beautiful talk. Thank you very much.